Father's Day. You know, God desires to be our Father. And uh, He is the perfect Father. And I am totally, totally aware that earthly fathers fail their children sometimes. We all do that. But I'm also aware that there is a perfect Father. In, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, these words. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. When we trust Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, He becomes our perfect Father who will never fail us, never leave us, and never forsake us. You know, that term, term Father is such an important concept that our society has missed. Uh, conceiving a child and being a father are not the same thing. Exactly right. And we need to understand that uh, in our society today and as Christians. It's interesting, the Bible says that we are adopted into the family of God. You know, I hear people say, well, you know, this was an unplanned situation, etc. Adoption is done by choice. We are adopted because God chose to, to bring us into his life as his children. And even Jesus, as he talked to the Father, addressed God as our Father. And I thought that was so, so significant. God, the Bible gives us such a, a beautiful picture um, as, we look at God, as we look at God of what a father should be, the perfect father. As I look at society today, and, and Daniel addresses this in a few minutes, uh, you know, we live in a society where, where our home is in trouble. And we need men to stand up right. and be leaders yep. and be fathers and to be husbands right. and to be godly men in their world today. Right. And you and I have the challenge to make that begin right here. And we are blessed to have men and women in this church who believe that and are working hard to make that happen. You know, for my own life, I can honestly say the hardest thing that I've ever done, the greatest challenge that I've ever had is to be a father, period, bar none. But it's also brought on some of the greatest joys and some of the greatest privileges in my life. Two weeks ago, we were in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and we rented a big condo, and I looked around, and there were 14 of us here. Dixie, my, my son and his wife, my daughter and her husband, and eight grandkids. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm still counting. I mean, who would have thought when I was your age I would be married, have two children, and eight grandchildren? I had no idea. I couldn't conceive of it. And I want to say to our young people, the decisions that you make right now, right now about your morality, about your relationship with Christ, about where you're going to go from this day forward, are not only going to affect you, they're going to affect a bunch of people you've never met. You've never conceived of the thought that I'm going to be a daddy, I'm going to be a mama, I'm going to be a grandpa, I'm going to be a grandmother. And those things are so I looked around, I thought, wow, myself and 13 others, who to thunk it, you know? Who to thunk it? And such a great thought, a great privilege. Father, such a great responsibility to teach our children, to teach our young boys, our, our young men to become men, to be responsible, to teach our young men how to love in a godly fashion. Isn't that important? To teach our, our daughters, to teach our daughters how to love and how to receive love and how to be treated with respect and dignity and not settle for some cheap relationship with some come-by-night young man. We need, you know, a, a young lady learns how to receive love by her relationship with her father. And what a great responsibility that we all have, that we all have. Some of us are beyond that age of raising our children, but we have a responsibility to teach our children. And you're going to hear a young man here in a moment who's going to share that with you eloquently. And I love Daniel. i got cold chills right now. He's going to share that with you eloquently, your challenge as a church to do that. Um, we, we prepare our children. I love the, the, the little thing in the video where the, young, where the father told his daughter that she loved him. and She kind of acted embarrassed, but she loved it. And you're beautiful. You're beautiful inside and out. Girls, I don't know. I've, you know, I don't know that side of the fence, but it's got to be wonderful to know that, you're, that, that a man that you love dearly, your father, 
respects you in that way and, and hopefully ultimately your husband. James Dobson was asked, what's the greatest gift that a man can give his child? And Brian's going to come back on that in a moment. But James Dobson's answer was that the greatest gift a man can give his child is to love their mother. And there's a lot of truth in that. We need to teach our children to love our mother. My daddy taught me. I know the worst thing I ever did was talk back to my mother one day. He taught me from both ends that was not acceptable. I needed to love my mother dearly. And I promise you from that day forward, I was a diff different person. Good parents, they don't happen by accident. Andrew Murray was asked the question about raising children. And he said, do not raise your children on your own. Turn your children over to God and ask God to raise them, rear them through you. Successful or not, that's what I've tried to do in my life, in my life. But again, I could not fathom that 50 years ago as a 12-year-old, the decisions that I made were going to affect my future children. Godly principles, the Bible is full of them. God created the home as a, self, as a safe place, an environment of security. You know, if you look back to Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and teach them to your children. When you're walking by the way, when you're sitting in the house, when you're out shopping, whatever you do. Teach your children to love God every, everywhere you are. In Ephesians, we're told, uh, fathers, bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. I mean, that's clear. That's black and white. We have a responsibility. Men, women, fathers, husbands, grandparents, church in a moment to teach our children. And I love Joshua. You know, everybody else was going a different way. And Joshua said, hey, boys. You can go whatever way you want, but I tell you what, as for me and the father of this house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's the way it's going to be. We're going to serve the Lord. And the thing is, we have a choice. We have a choice about that. It either comes by accident or it comes by choice. Young people, regardless of what has happened in your life, gone on in your life, good experiences, bad experiences, you have a choice about what kind of mother you're going to be, what kind of father you're going to be. You may not have had everything you want, but it can be different. And I promise you, if you'll model your life after God's word, God's will, you will be the man, the woman God has called you to be. I promise you that. The Bible also has some rec rec recordings of people who have, who have um, not, not followed the principles. I'm reminded of Eli the prophet, and the Bible says that Eli was, his sons were literally scoundrels, that they were sinners. And the thing is, he didn't discipline. He didn't do what God said. And because of that, there was punishment in his family. David, a man after God's own heart, he slipped and stumbled. We've all slipped and stumbled. But the Bible says there was enmity, there was problems in his family from then on. That's a warning. I've always taken that as a sacred warning for me. We affect others. I think in the New Testament of Peter, when he went to talk, when he went to share the gospel with Cornelius. You remember that? Cornelius got all of his family together. The dad said, hey kids, we're going to meet with Peter whether you like it or not. And they all were exposed to the gospel. Remember Paul and Silas when they were released from prison? And, and, and uh, I mean, yeah, they were released from prison. The jailer comes in and Paul starts to share the gospel. The jailer brought all of his family in. And because the jailer brought his family in, he was unsaved at the time, but he was the head of his home. His family were all saved, and they were all baptized. God's called us. God's called us to be faithful, and when we're faithful, he will bless us beyond our imagination. So I thought about fathers. The responsibility is, yes, to provide for our children, but to love our children, to protect our children, to discipline our children. And that's something that's so lacking today, to teach obedience to teach our children to love, to teach our children to forgive, to be an example, to be a leader, and to share and have time for our children. We're all so busy, but we all have the same amount of time. And there's such a fine battle between providing for and being there for our kids. We need to take time for our children. I was blessed with a godly father. My dad was a, a, a devoted church man, a devoted Christian, not outspoken. But I think back taught me how to love, to respect, 
He taught me how to work. Now, I did say respect. He taught me how to respect. He taught me how to provide for my family. He taught me how to treat a, a lady like he treated my mother. You know, I thought back to that. Uh, and my ma parents were married um, 43 years. I, I saw them have one little disagreement over the door and I'd get open quick enough. I never saw them have a fight in 43 years. I never saw them have a cross word, yell, scream, throw a fit. My daddy taught me how to treat a lady like a lady. And I'm, I'm so blessed for that. Dad had a home that was safe and secure. He taught me how to provide. And he gave me, he gave me an example of heritage to pass along. God is our perfect Heavenly Father for all eternity. And regardless of what's going on in your life, you have a choice. And God would say, put me first, live in my will, walk by my word, and you will be the person. Ladies, men, boys, girls, youth, if we do that, we'll be the person that God wants us to be. Bottom line, God wants us to have an eternal, eternal, ultimate, permanent relationship as his child, as the perfect father, the perfect example throughout all eternity. Let me close with this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter, 16, chapter 6. I will be a father to you. I will be a father to you, a perfect father. You will be my sons and my daughters says the Lord Almighty. Amen. So I guess now you're trying to figure out why the youth pastor who doesn't have any children of his own is going to speak on Father's Day, right? But, uh, but the thing is, is whether we see it or not, we are all a father to somebody. We're all a mother to somebody because we all set an example to somebody's life. Amen. And so whether we want to or not, somebody is looking at us. This morning I was honored and, and uh, some of the students presented me with a card, a Happy Father's Day card. And told me that they looked up to me as, as a father how honored I am to, to be able to say that that they they are able to do that I, I want to come from a different standpoint you know Hay, Haywood is a father he's a grandfather and his father has been on uh, been gone or now gone to be with Jesus uh, Brian is a father and uh, his father's now gone to be with the Lord I'm not a father and my father is still alive but even though I'm not a father I can speak because I see something on a weekly basis that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to get to see. I can tell you about two different kinds of people who come through these doors. Out of about 130 to 170 young people that I come into contact every week that either somehow in some way are affected by real life student ministries in Elkhorn Baptist Church, I can tell you about two different types of people, Elkhorn, who I deal with. I deal with those who have parents involved in their life and those who do not have parents involved in their life and there is a total difference between the two I'm telling you this morning when somebody comes in I can tell if mom and dad have taken time to invest in their life because when those students come in they invest in other lives they have love in their life they, they, they show they want to be active they, they want to they have respect for authority because mom and dad has taken time to teach them that but then I also see those students who come through the doors and and they lack in that in fact, they, they lack in, in, in even being who they are. Most of them walk with their heads down. and They don't really have much self-esteem because nobody takes time to affirm them and tell them that they love them and that they want to invest in their life. A few Wednesday nights ago, I always like to take time and make sure that our students understand that somebody loves them because believe it or not, we don't live in a world where everybody hears, I love you. Well, we do, but we love everything, don't we? We love our cars and our house and our church. But do we love like Jesus loves? Do we actually love? And so the students were sitting before us, and, and I sat down and I said, guys, I just want to remind you, I, I don't know if anybody's heard this in a while or haven't heard it in a while, but I just want you to know uh, that, that I love you, that this church loves you, and that Jesus loves you. Amen? And so we, we, got, we, got, we ended that night, and we were out running around and talking and stuff, and a young man who's actually here this morning, come up and he approached me and he had tears in his eyes and I'm like what's wrong he said man it's been over a week since my mama said she loved me see they, they don't necessarily hear that every day they don't necessarily hear that all the time and so it's our job not only as a church but it's our job as parents and as mothers and as fathers and especially a father because we are the head of the household to rise up and to say you know what I don't care you don't need to be their best friend parents hallelujah you need to be a parent figure 
And that's a hard word, and we hear that all the time, and we're like, woo, amen, amen. But then we go ahead and we give them whatever they want. So take their phone away from 30 minutes and, and give them a pat them on the back and tell them it's all right, Jesus loves them. It's okay to discipline your child because I promise you this, when people call and they say, man, what's going on with y'all student ministry out there? Y'all are growing like crazy. I go, you know what, you know what it is? We give them structure, and we, we, we go by rules, and we preach Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's exactly how it works in the house. You, when you have structure, when you go by the rules and you preach Jesus, you watch how your family will thrive. Amen? And that's exactly what it takes. I remember growing up as a, as a student or as a child, and, and my father, um, what a man he was. And I know I refer to him a lot. I, I'm very blessed to have a, a man in my life who has taught me so much. And, but Bobby, he didn't, he didn't necessarily take the time to head us up at the table and say we're going to pray. He didn't, in fact, even get up and go to church with us a lot of Sunday mornings until I was a teenager. But the thing was, I do remember about my father, is he at least took time to make sure, Tommy, I can swing a hammer. I know how to build things. I know how to wire things. I can fix motors. I can do things like that. And I'm not saying that, that that's it because there's so much more than that. But do you know the reason I can do that? Do you know the reason that some of you all in here can do that? It's because somebody is taking time to invest in our lives. I think we cut it short so many times. Haywood was exactly right, and Brian will hit on this too. It's so much more than just being a daddy. There's a lot of dads out here. some dads in here today. We don't need dads. We need fathers. We need men to rise up and say, you know what? Nobody else can have this household. We're going to run it the way God says run it, and we're going to praise Him no matter what. Shouldn't be a question whether or not we're going to church on Sunday. Hallelujah. You should get up, get out of bed, and get your kids in church. And make them mine. I'm telling you, I see the results of this. Do you know I get to see the results of what you instill into your children? I can tell how you feel about this church, how you feel about me as a youth pastor, how you feel about the staff and the leadership, how you feel about our trips, because they come talking about it. When they come and I can sense their attitude and when they sense hostility or I sense hostility about me or something that's going on, usually it's passed down from the parents. Because whatever you're sharing at the dinner table, those ears are picking up. I'm telling you guys, it's important, but it's just like I shared with them this morning. This week out at, at kids' camp, we had a great week at kids' camp. Amen. It was a great week. Lots of, lots of, lots of lives were changed. We, still, we invested in those kids' lives. But here's the deal. Just like the little kids watch every move they make. We remember how it was, don't we? You know, when you're little, you want to be just like a teenager. Man, I can't wait to drive. Man, I can't wait to be in high school. Man, I can't wait to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I can't wait to do that. And then you get there and you're like, huh. you, know, you know what I'm saying? And then, and then you're like, can't wait to go to college. Can't wait to get a job. And then you get a job and you're like, huh. you know, I, I don't know when to, the, hey, Wood, do you wish to get any older? I mean, does it, does it, does it keep going? It just gets better with Jesus? Okay. But anyway, we always wish we want more. But the little kids want to be like them, but they want to be like us. And the example that we set for them is what the legacy is going to live on. Amen? Amen. Amen. I heard a pastor say one time, he said, if you want to see how you raised your children, look at your grandchildren. If you want to see how you raised your children, just look at your grandchildren and how true that is. Now listen, I know there's many a men and a women. Many men and women of God who have instilled and invested many, many hours inside of their children, and their children have went astray. And I know that parenting is a fine line. There's a fine line in between what's too far, what's not enough, and, and everything else. You've got to be real careful. But I'm telling you one thing, there's something that works. And it's not always that we have the right answers. It's not always that the church is the place to turn to for, for the exact answer. But there's someone that we can, and it's called Jesus Christ. Amen? When we look at His example and what He instilled into to, to the family, then we'll see exactly what it is. I want to share a couple of verses with you just real quickly. This is exactly kind of where I'm, I'm coming from. This is what I thought when I read this. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in John, and I'm going to start in, in chapter 8 and verse 41, and it says, You are doing the works of your Father. Now, I paraphrase that because Jesus was speaking those words. He says, You are doing the works of your Father. I told the uh, mission team uh, Friday night, we were at Jimmy and Allison Garrett's, uh, for uh, just kind of a, a prayer service and a bonfire, we we're just kind of hanging out. And we begin to talk, and I, I begin to tell them how important it is to value your parents and to make sure that they know that you love them because you may never have the opportunity to tell them that again. And I said, you know, a lot of the reason I am the way I am today is because people have invested in my life and they have shown me how to do things. 
you know, don't we all say, I'll never be like my parents when I get older. Anybody else been like that? You had liars. I, everybody's like that. And so we always say, I'll never be like that. I'll never do that. I'll never yell at my kids like that. And then we get older and we find ourselves doing it. But the thing is, is I look back and Robbie, I find myself doing things that daddy does. Paige tells me we'll go in and we'll visit and she goes, you're just like your daddy. You walk like him. You talk like him. You eat like him. You do everything just like your daddy. And, and that's good because I love the man that my daddy is. But the reason I'm like that is because he instilled that into me. He gave me the works that he's invested into my life. Amen. And so the last verse is this, John 3, 35. And it says, the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. And it goes right again with it. Now that's actually talking about the holy father God who has given Jesus everything and placed the world in his hands. But here's what I see. Fathers, when you give to your children... And it's so much more than just saying, hey, I love you, and showing up for one ball game out of all the 25 that they have. But actually taking time and saying, you know what? If i got to leave work a little early today, if i got to, if I got to cancel an appointment that I have to spend a little bit more time to let them know that I love them, it would be worth it because that will pay off down the road. Money can buy a whole lot of things, but money cannot buy a relationship with your children. You can buy them all sorts of cars, you can buy them a house, you can buy them all the clothes that you want to. And that's important when they're young. But when they get older and you're in the nursing home, who's going to come take care of you then? Because money cannot buy relationships. Church, we have got to instill and we have got to invest in our young people. It is so important. Trust me, I get to see both sides of how people invest into their children. Amen. Thank you. Good deal. Haywood, thank you. Daniel, thank you. Church, thank you for being a soul winning, life changing church. Um, today, I get to wind this up, and I'm going to give an altar call here in just a moment. But uh, I was coming home Friday on vacation. God just dropped a word, just a quick word in my spirit, and I want to give it to you. It comes out of Ezekiel chapter 22. Title this. I sought for a man. I sought for a man. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 29 and 30 says, The people of the land have practiced abuse of authority and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and the needy and have threatened people without justice. And look what God says. I sought for a man. God said these words, I sought for a man. But he said these words, that they would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me and the land so I would not destroy it. And watch these fast last words. But I found none. God sought for a man. He looked for a man. He seeked a man. But he said, I found none. God said, I'm looking for real men. Hallelujah. I'm looking for real fathers. I'm looking for men that are God chasers, filled with the Holy Spirit and sold out and on fire and not ashamed of the gospel, not ashamed of Jesus Christ, that even at the workplace, a, a real father, a real man of God will not compromise their values of God and compromise to a work ethic over a God ethic. Hallelujah. They'll con they will not compromise that. God says, I sought for a man, but I found none. I found none. I'm going to give you some statistics right now. It's going to blow your mind. These are true statistics according to Barner Research. And I want you to listen to these statistics. 63 of youth suicides happen in fatherless homes. 85% of children who have behavioral disorders come from a fatherless home. 71% of high school dropouts come from a fatherless home. 77% of teenagers and kids in rehab today come from fatherless homes. Almost 50% of children born today are born into fatherless homes. 72%, I hope I'm not born, y'all, but if I am, you're dead. 72% of teenage murders, listen to this, 72% of teenage murders grew up without a father. 70% of kids incarcerated right now came from a fatherless home. Listen to this statistic. Girls who are raised in a fatherless home 
to her. 400, I mean, 164 percent more likely to become pregnant before marriage. 164 percent. 92 percent of marriages end in divorce due to children growing up without a father. That broke my heart. When I read that, that broke my heart. And I'm going to give you an interesting fact that you probably have never even thought about, but I want to, I want to want you to exercise your brain muscle today. Have you ever thought about how the government builds? A jail cell? How the government sets aside time and come up with the dimensions of a jail or a penitentiary? Here's what they do. They look at sixth graders. They look at sixth graders. They look at boys and girls who are in the sixth grade. They look at their reading scores and their math scores. And the third thing they look at is if they have a father, an active father in their life. Statistics say that if these kids have bad math scores and reading scores, and they do not have an active father in their life, check this out, 70%, they have a 70% chance they will end up in jail. So let me just blow your mind right now real quick. The government builds jail cells, rooms to hold children and adults according to a sixth grader. It's amazing to look at sixth graders' math and reading scores, and if they don't have a father, they say 70% of those kids will end up in jail. Let me give you four things real quick that a father needs to be. That a father needs to be, according to this Bible. God says, I looked for a man. I sought a man, but he said, I found none. He found no man. What was he talking about? Four things that a father needs to be. Number one, be saved. Everybody say, be saved. Come on, say, be saved. Everybody say, I am saved. Your children need to know and they need to see a born-again daddy and a father. Your children, when they look at you, one thing, and I, I, I agree with Dr. James Dobson. He's a smart man, very intellectual. But here's what I would say. The greatest gift, the greatest gift you can give your children is not for them to question, if you were to die, would you go to heaven or hell? The greatest gift that you can give your children it's for them to be able to say, my dad, if he were to die, I know I will see him again because he was born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and he's in heaven with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. I buried my daddy two years ago. Two years ago, I stood over my daddy's casket. But the peace that I had in me is as hard as day it was in my life to know that my daddy was absent from me. I no longer would hear him say, Brian, I love you. But here's what he did in me, Sheila. He bestilled in me, he bestowed in me an uh, ethic in me that I know that when I stood over my daddy, I know that I will and I shall see him again because he settled that a long time ago. He knew Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The hardest thing I do in my life is to stand over somebody that you do not know if they're born again. You do not know where they're spending eternity. You don't know what's going on in their life. Daddies, listen to me. Fathers, settle it now. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the greatest gift that you can give your child today is to come to this altar and say, I want Jesus. I need Jesus. That's it. You say, well, Brian, I did that a long time ago. Let me ask you something. How, is it working for you? Are you bearing fruit, Daddy? With your children seeing you, on Sunday morning, are you standing in the bed while mama gets them up and takes them to church? Or are you the God leader, the God man, hallelujah, the God daddy of that house that says, no, we're going to church whether you like it or not. Get up and get ready. Come on, let's go get it on with Jesus, amen? That's a daddy. Oh, we're good at working, putting 100 hours in a week and giving God two hours on a Sunday. Out of 168 hours in a week, most Christians give God one hour. I have 168 hours a week. Most people give God one hour. You know what I call that? Not sold out. Your, your priorities are wrong. They're, they're just not right. That's why your house is not in order. So listen to this. Be saved. The second thing is this. Be sincere. Everybody say, be sincere. Yeah, fathers should sincerely and deeply love your children. Yes, my kids get on my nerves. I don't have, I don't have uh, the Leave it to Beaver family. I am not Ward, I'm t I, whatever his name is. I, I, I'm, I'm not him. My, my children, yes, get under my skin. Yes, my ears turn red. 
Yes, sometimes I w- I'm telling you I want to kick them in the name of Jesus. And y'all can look at me like you're sitting there all dignified, sanctified, glorified, but I know this, there's the time that you're going to say, you know what, he's telling the truth in this pulpit today. And so I'm not going to sit here and preach you an easy sermon that you're going to sit there and go, well, praise the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. You've got to deeply love your children. Listen to me. Your children should, should sincerely know that you love their mama. Your children should know that, that, that their daddy loves their mama. Your children should bust you holding mama's hand sometimes. I used to think, I said, no, you know. Your children should kiss you, I mean, <laughs> watch you kissing mama. You say, Brian, really? Your kids should bust you kissing mama. And Destiny and Blake is still look Blake 22 and Destiny coming on 9. They'll look at me and go, ooh, daddy. And I'm like, come on, mama. You know what I'm saying? That's just the way it is. That makes it worse when people say, ooh, that's nasty. I'm like, mm, you know, never mind. You, it's on then. It's on then. Listen, you've got to be sincere in, in, in your love with your, with your family. How many of you know it's so easy, like Daniel was saying, it's so easy to, to see how people's weeks have been. And then all of a sudden, man, we come into church and we think we, we, we're okay. The third thing is this. you got to be submitted. you got to be saved. you got to be sincere. Number three, you, ne- you need to be submitted. Everybody say submitted. You need to be submitted to, to the Word of God. Submit it to the house of God. Man, you need to be submitted and get on your knees and cry out to God. You really do. You need to cry out to God. I don't know about you, but I have a real family. I have a real family. I'm so sick and tired of plastic Christianity. I'm so tired of the Leave it to Beaver household. I'm so tired. Like, they act like nothing ever comes their way. Nothing comes against them. It's a perfect life. It's a perfect marriage. They got three kids. Uh, three little ducklings, they got a white house and a picket fence, a big old nice car, big old nice house. Nothing ever goes wrong with them. Watch this. That's a lie. That is a lie. That is such a lie. Here's a perfect Sunday for a perfect family. They'll, they'll get their kids up on Sunday. Matter of fact, they didn't even get their kids up. They set their alarm clock. And all of a sudden, they'll, the kids will get themselves ready. And they'll walk into the living room, and they'll have their little suits on, like three little ducklings, hint, 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 you know? Three little ducklings, and they'll sit there and go, Mother, we're ready. Mother, we're ready to go to church. And all of a sudden, man, you'll get in the car, and this is a perfect, perfect family. Three kids in the back seat, and mom and daddy up front holding hands, and little kids in the back, and all of a sudden, they're synchronizing together. They're all together. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible. Like that. <laughs> Just like that. They're all in harmony, man. They're harmonizing. Daddy and mama's holding hands and people pulling out in front of them on Highway 7. They're going, blessed be the name. They'll walk into church and everything goes good in the kids' zone. And they'll come over and they're all the seats. They get their perfect seat and perfect parking spot. Now let me preach some truth. Now let's have some real talk. Your kids don't want to get up on Sunday. It's your only day off. I hear this all the time. They don't set alarm clocks. They don't believe in alarm clocks. They don't care if you're late on time. It don't matter. And all of a sudden, you'll have them ready, all three of them. And then one of them will, will sneak and eat a cookie. And they'll have cookie all down their, their little clothes and stuff. And Mama has to go in and change them again. And Daddy's outside in the car, honk, 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 honk. Mama, where you at? When Daddy should be inside helping Mama get the babies ready to come to church. Oh, that's some good preaching, whether you like it or not. You see, daddies are active. They're, they're involved. They're engaged. They're part of. They want to be involved. Listen, you can't be a father and be disconnected. You've got to be connected and engaged. And so when you come to church, let me get back to this story. They come to church and there's no seat, no parking spot. And you're mad at your husband, even though you're sitting beside him. Hit him, hallelujah. 
And all of a sudden, Greg will stand up and he'll say, everybody, let's sing, oh, happy day. You know what I'm saying? And then there you are, you're, you're mad, and the kids got cookies all over their suits and stuff, and they wasn't singing, oh, Jesus, bless me, whatever. They was in the back fussing and fighting and kicking. And then you pull up to church, and all of a sudden go, now y'all be still, everybody's looking. <laughs> that right there is what I'm talking about. That is the Rafferty household. And that is your household. Because I've heard some of your talk. So I know what you're saying. You say, well, I hear that. I hear it all the time. Well, what's the, what's the use? I'm tired. It's my only day off. I'm not getting anything out of the services. I'm mad at my husband. I'm mad at my wife. My kids are heathens and this, that, and the other. I don't even understand what the pastor's saying. The praise team's too late, blah, blah, blah. But here's what I'm trying to get in your spirit today. There is something about submission. There is something about even when you don't want to go, go anyhow. When, you, when you're in church and you don't even feel like praising God, that's when you need to have a double hallelujah anyhow. That's when we don't want to clap. You just need to say, God, I don't like, I don't feel good, but I'm going to clap anyway. Amen? I'm going to sing that much louder, and the babies are going to get it eventually. Because the Bible says the anointing is what breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. So see, you may be sitting under my teaching today, sitting there going, well, that's me. Will you will defeat the enemy? And I wrote this down. Listen to me. Submission equals promotion. Submission. The more you are submitted, the higher you will go. The higher you will go. Last point. Be stable. Be stable. Everybody say be stable. God said, I sought for a man, but I found none. That hurt my heart when I read that. I said, surely there was one man, one God-filled man, one man that was sold out and on fire for God, and he had values and integrity in his life. But God says, I searched, I seek, I look for, and I tried to seek for that man, but I found none. I found none. See, being stable means, come hell or high water, I'm God's man. No matter what happens, I'm Blake's daddy and I'm Destiny's daddy. That's my family. This is my church. He's my God. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. Come hell or high water, I'm going to praise Him because I'm stable in the Lord. I'm fit in the Lord. I'm not shaking in the Lord. I know who I am in the Lord. Y'all help me preach in this house today. Be stable. Good, bad, or ugly will serve the Lord. It took me a long time to say this, Jim, in my life. With Dana or without Dana? Now, I want her. It's my Dino. It's my right rib. That's the cream of my coffee. That's my Dino. I, got, I want her. I desire her. I love her. But I have found in my life I don't serve God based according to Dana. I serve God because I've got a relationship with God. And because I got a relationship, he spills over in my life, into my wife, into my children, and they hopefully want what our daddy's got. Hallelujah. Do your children want what you got? The, husband, the word husband comes from two Latin words. I want you all to write this down. Praise team, you guys come. Y'all didn't think we could do it, did you? Husband comes from the Latin word, two words. Listen to me. House band. Husband comes from a Latin word, two words, house band. Everybody say house band. What this means, it's like a rubber band. The husband's like a rubber band. He's what holds the house together. He's the one that holds everything together. If it's trying to fall apart, the house band will band it back together. The husband will stand up when nobody else stands up. One of, the, one of the things that I hate in, in, in when, I, when I'm around people is when husbands degrade their wife. Or wives degrade their husband. That's the worst thing you could ever do is tear down your loved one in front of other people. Above all else, we should be encouragers. And even though me and Danny don't see eye to eye, I love that girl. 
I love her so much. And even though my children disobey me sometimes, you know what? Here's, I, I'm to the, listen to me. One time, Dana asked, she said, what if Blake drinks beer? I said, he'll get drunk. And y'all think, y'all think I'm kidding when I talk like it. This is the way I talk. I'm not going to change at church and go out and be a transformer, get to a phone booth and go, preacher. I'm not going to do that. She said, what if he does this and what if he does that? I'm going to say, he's going to die early. Because here's what I know. Blake is 22. And I love the Lord. I'm sold out to God. I've already dedicated my children over to the Lord. Blake, I'm just borrowing Blake. I'm just borrowing destiny. I can't make them do anything. I can't destiny. And I can't Blake if he's still living at home. But here's what I know, Dan says, what if he goes out and gets drunk? I'm like, first of all, he don't drink. But second of all, if he does, he's going to get drunk. And Dan says, how, how do you have peace like that? I'm like, because I trust the Lord. I just trust the Lord. Uh, what, what if something happens bad at the church and something goes wrong, this, that, and the other? I don't own y'all. You're going to do what you want to do. A man's going to do whatever a man wants to do. I'm just here preaching the truth. If you can take it and live it, or you're not going to live it, you're going to be a miserable man. You'll eventually see me anyway because it's going to be a counseling meeting. That's right. So here's what I have found out. God says, I sought for men. I sought for a real man. I sought for a God man. I sought, sought for a God chaser. I, I sought for a man that stood out heads and shoulders above anybody else. My question to you is this. Are you that man? Are you that man? I ask people this all the time. If your daughter was getting married, would you want her to marry a man like you? If your son was getting married, would you want him to marry a woman like you? Boy, that changed my life. Something else that changed my life when I quit looking at Dana as just, just as my wife. I started looking at her as my gift from the Lord. And if you have a gift, you've got to open it. The reason why some of you marriages, I don't know why I'm saying this, I just feel this in my heart. The reason why a lot of marriages are failing is because you're not opening the gift called marriage. Boy, it's so good. You're looking at everything. Who gave you the gift and blah, blah, blah. I wonder what's in the gift. And you're looking at all kinds of different things, but you're not opening the gift of marriage. You're not opening the gift called fatherhood. You're not opening the gift called life. Church, live. Live while you're living. Y'all remember the sermon I preached, What If Graveyards Could Speak? If dead people could get out of the graveyard, they'd look at us today and say, write that book. Go to school. Do what you got to do. You be the best man you can be. Live for the Lord while you got a chance to live for the Lord. I'm telling you, if graveyards could preach, what a sermon it would be. What a sermon it would be. Closing, here's what I know. God sought for a man. The question is, are you the man?